gentleness is strength under control. When people fail to keep their strength under control, nations invade other nations. Or strong nations invade weaker nations because they have the strength to do so. Strong companies take, take over small companies even without considering the employees. Even sometimes to the detriment of those employees, they still take it over and fire everybody and bring a new team. Why? Because the stronger doesn't care about the weaker. Strength under control. When we fail to keep our strength under control, we witness injustice in homes. We witness violence in homes and societies. Strength under control. But the question I want to, some of the questions I want to ask this morning is, is, is gentleness a sign of weakness? When is the right time to use your strength? If you keep your strength under control, when is the right time to really hit someone? When is the right time to use your strength? When is the right time for a country to attack another country? Or how can one keep his strength or her strength under control? How can we keep our strength under control? The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is powerful. But the Bible also says that the Holy Spirit is gentle. So the same powerful Holy Spirit can display strength and can also display Gentleness. Paul says that the Spirit of God produces gentleness in us. As powerful as he is, he produces gentleness in us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such things... There is no law. How do we show strength, but at the same time, control it? The first step I would like to suggest to you this morning is to recognize your strength. Before you keep it under control, you need to know it. Before you keep your strength under control, you need to know what is that strength you are keeping under control. You need to know how strong you are. You can't keep something you don't have under control. So you need to know your strength. First step, everyone has some strength. Every one of us is strong in some areas. And everyone can abuse their strength. Some people have physical strength. Some people have mental strength. Some people have emotional strength. Some people have financial strength. We have different type of strength. Some people have different skills and different talent. We have different type, types of strength. And even if you don't have the money, you don't have the physical strength, you may have relationships. You know someone who knows someone who knows someone. And that in life is a strength. To be able... To connect with people is strength. So you cannot keep under control something you don't recognize. You need to know what is my strength. What is the thing I need to keep under control? Gentleness is strength under control. The fact that the Holy Spirit gives you gentleness, it means you have some strength, but you can abuse them. So that you don't abuse your strength, the Holy Spirit gives you gentleness so you can use your strength under control. We are all strong in some areas. We are all strong one way or another. And we are all stronger than someone. We are all stronger than someone. There will always be someone stronger than you and someone weaker than you in life. There will always be someone who knows better than you and someone who doesn't. 
there will always be someone who has more than you and someone who has less than you. There will always be that. It doesn't matter how rich you become. There will always be someone who has something that you don't have and someone who doesn't have what you have. So we will always find ourselves in the middle of these two groups, those who have more and those who have less than us. Someone is always ahead of you, not the same person, but at each time, each season of your life, you will have some people ahead of you and you will have some people behind you. So you need to recognize your strength and recognize where you are. Paul is one of the greatest um, evangelists or apostles in the Bible. And even Paul recognized his strength. And let's read what he said. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 5 to 6. Now I consider myself in no way inferior to the super apostles. What does it mean? I don't consider myself lower than those you think are super apostles. Like when you talk about Peter and John, you should consider me among them. He also says in 2 Corinthians 12, 6 to 7. For if I want to boast, I will not be a fool. If I want to brag about myself, no, that will make sense. Because I will be telling the truth. This is Paul telling people. Now, I will be telling the truth if I boast. But I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me or hears from me. Especially because of the extraordinary revelations. Paul is telling people that I see spiritual things. I see prophecies and vision. I see spiritual things. Extraordinary revelations Paul receives and he's telling people I see these things. He's boasting Mm, kind of, about his strength. Gently, yes, gently. <laughs> He's boasting gently about his strength. He recognizes. If you read verse 6 uh, of, of 2 Corinthians 15, uh, 11, 5, he says, uh, Though untrained in public speaking, I'm certainly not untrained in knowledge. What is he talking about? He's saying that he's trained in knowledge. He knows stuff. Paul is bragging. He's recognizing his strength. And he's telling the church that I'm smart, educated. I know things. And I'm one of the super apostles. And I see visions. And I can prophesy. He's telling them all these things. So intellectually, I'm strong. Spiritually, I'm there. In terms of position in the society, I'm up there. Super apostle. I'm not less than them. He recognizes his strength. And then he says in Second in First Corinthians 14, 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. <laughs> Paul is telling them, all of you here thinking that you are spiritual, I am more than you. I speak in tongues more than all of you. Hmm. Interesting. He recognizes his strength. There is nothing wrong with acknowledging your strength. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, you should acknowledge your strength to operate effectively in life. You need to know your strength so that you can know where to invest your time in life. We waste time when we try to do everything. You need to know what you are good at and put your energy in those areas. What do you do naturally well? What do you do and everybody around you will say, oh, how did you do that? People will tell you, oh, you are good at that. What do you do better than people around you? The challenge is that some people think they are good at nothing. Some of us, we think we are good at nothing. We don't recognize our strength. And other people think they are good at everything. So we have two extremes. 
We have people who think they know everything, and we have people who think they don't know anything. There are people who think they can do everything, and they try to do everything. And we have people who think they can't do anything. No one is good at everything. And no one is good, is no good at anything. No one. We are all good at something. All of us, we are good at something. So maybe you've been told that you are good at nothing. Maybe you are, you've, been told, you've been called good for nothing. You know, that's language. Maybe someone has called you good for nothing. You are good at nothing. The enemy's strategy is to make sure he discourages you from acknowledging your strength so that he can get one less player in God's team. Every time you think you are not good at something, God gets one less player discouraged to do what they're supposed to do. The enemy will make sure he tells you you are good at nothing so that God can get one less soldier in his army fighting for his cause. Every time you don't do what you are supposed to do because you think you are not good at anything, we have one less soldier fighting for God. The enemy will make sure you think you are good at nothing so that we have one less player on God's team, one less soldier in God's army. Don't think you are good at nothing. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. You are good for nothing. No one is useless on God's team. You are not useless. We all have something. No one has everything. We all have some strength. There is a reason why I stay here a bit longer. Because I know some of us, we feel discouraged. Because we can look at the people who are accomplishing more. We look at the people with skills and people with more. And we think, oh, I would love to be like that. You have something. You have something. Low self-esteem is pride in disguise. Low self-esteem is focusing on self while comparing yourself to those who have more than you and forgetting those who don't have. It is selfish to think low of yourself. Why? Because there are people who need what you have. There are people who need your strength. And when you corner yourself in your bubble, thinking that you are not good enough, those people who were supposed to benefit from your strength are penalized. Because you are in a corner, you can't do what you were called to do. Comparing yourself for people who have more than you, you forget that there are people who don't have what you have. Therefore, you penalize them. That's the consequence of low self-esteem. It's not about you. Even if you think everybody else is stronger than you, around you, remember there are people who are not as good as you are. And when you do what you are called to do, those people will learn from you. Those people will benefit from you. Those people will be blessed by what you do. At work, at home, at church. When you do what you are called to do, when you do what you are good at, some people are watching you. Some people are benefiting from what you are doing. And after recognizing your strength, you move to the next step, which is now take control of it. Restrain your strength is the second point. Someone said, an unchecked strength is a weakness. And a checked weakness can become a strength. The, the, the Greek word for gentleness is prowse. Prowse. It's translated as meekness in the Old English or gentleness. In the Old Testament, this prophecy was given regarding the Messiah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble 
and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. This passage was fulfilled in the New Testament. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, look at how Matthew quoted the same prophecy from Zechariah. Pay attention to the word humble. It's changing in Matthew 21, 5. Tell daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fall of a beast of burden. Where is the Karai used the word humble? Matthew used the word gentle. Gentleness has the element of humility. Strength under control is the highest form of humility. Jesus is described as a humble king by Zechariah and gentle by, king, by, 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 by Matthew. Jesus was strong, but he kept his strength under control. The creator of the universe came down. He walked on our street. He ate our food. He slept under our roofs. The creator of the universe died for us all. Jesus became one of us to save all of us. He humbled himself. He had the power to destroy everyone around him. But he chose not to. But he chose to use his power to heal, to bless to help, to feed the people around him. A humble person does not use their strength to look down on others or to get more from others. A gentle person does not use their power to rule over people, but to serve. Gentleness is the ability to use your strength to bless others. Gentle people serve, give, feed, help just like Jesus did. They used their strength to solve problems, just like Jesus did. Why do we call men gentlemen? Not all of us are called gentlemen. We only call a man a gentleman when they act humbly. They open a door for a lady. They serve food. They, they, oh, this is a gentleman. Why do we call them gentle? Because we know they are naturally strong. And they choose to serve. That's the definition of gentlemen. When they use their strength, their strength to abuse, we don't call them gentlemen. We call them gentlemen when we know they are strong, but they choose to restrain their strength. Gentleness is humility. You know, I, I was learning to swim. And I think I was using too much strength. I was slapping the water. And I couldn't move. I was sinking instead of floating. I was tense, using too much strength. And the trainer told me, you are using too much strength. Can you do it gently? Instead of doing it gently, I did it slowly. <laughs> and nothing happened again. I sunk again. There is a difference between gentleness and slowness. Slowness is a weakness. Gentleness is strength under control. Until you learn how to use your strength gently, you can't swim. Those who swim know what I'm talking about. It's strength under control. You still use your strength, but under control. What God wants for us is to be gentle people. We know we have strength, but we keep it under control. We only use it when it's required. We use it to build, to help, to feed, not to destroy and revenge. The danger of knowing your strength, for many people who know their strength, is to think they can do it all on their own. 
and leave God out of it. And most people who have recognized their strength and they are walking in their capacity, they tend to be proud. Most people who are skilled and they, they've made it in life and they know where they, what they are good at, they're arrogant. Most of them. Why? Because they leave God out of it. That's why I want to end with this point. Rely on God. People who are naturally passive are not gentle. Gentleness is what Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. The gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. He was not talking about weak people. He was not talking about those who don't disagree. He was not talking about those who can be pushed around. When he said, the gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. When Jesus used the word gentle in the New Testament, he advocated for a quality every Christian needs to develop. Whether or not they are naturally inclined to it, he was speaking of an attribute that requires divine help to develop. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul spoke of the fruit of the Spirit when he included gentleness because we become gentle people in the biblical sense only as we yield ourselves to the Lord and let the Spirit work in our lives. A gentle person in the biblical sense recognizes their strength and their weaknesses and take both your strength and your weaknesses. You give them to Jesus. You submit them to Jesus. You admit that you are weak. You admit that you are strong. Your strength and your weaknesses, you give both to Jesus. If you recognize that you are successful, not dependent on your own strength, you will look at other people with humble eyes. We brag because we, we are arrogant because we think we've made it on, in our own strength. We think we are better than others. We've studied more. We've worked hard. We've strategized. We've done this and we've done that. And we look down on people because we think they didn't do enough. A humble person recognizes that, okay, God used my, my, my mind. God used my, 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 ability, my mental capacity. God used my skills. And he also used my weaknesses. And where I am and whatever I have today is not the result of me. It's a result of God working through me. That makes you humble. Paul the apostle recognized that his success had nothing to do with his abilities and strength that's why he said this i'm able to do all things through christ who strengthens me in philippians chapter 4 verse 13 he recognized that everything i do it's not because i'm strong it's not because i'm capable or gifted it's because christ is working through me wait a moment is this the same paul we heard that he was bragging about his gift who is saying now, it's not about my gift. It's now about Christ in me. This same Paul, we know he's smart. We know he's gifted. He's spiritual. He speaks in tongues more than everybody else. Now he's claiming that he doesn't do these things because he's strong, but because Christ is working through him. This is humility. Most of us, if we are given the talent of Paul, the ability of Paul, we will crush everybody. Will step on people's head. He did not take credit from his strength. He boasted about his weaknesses. Let's, let, let, let's see what Paul said. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17 to 18. So the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. For it is not the one commanding himself who is approved, but the one the Lord commands. Not the one who sent himself, the one who was sent by God. He's boasting now, not about his strength, but in the Lord. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 11.6. Though untrained in public speaking, I am certainly not untrained in knowledge. He acknowledged that he was untrained in public speaking. Paul was not good at public speaking. It was not fun to listen to Paul in public. No, Paul could not hold your attention for long. That's why someone slept and fell and died. When Paul was speaking, it was boring. 
He was not go a good public speaker. He was good at writing. Very good at writing. When you read his letter, you are like, great. Hmm, I can't wait to listen to this guy. When he comes, oh. <laughs> Is it the same person? He acknowledged it. And some people started to talk about it. He addresses this three times in his letters. Some people are saying that I'm not good in, in my prayer. Yeah, you are not. But he acknowledged it. it. It did not stop him from doing what he was called to do. He kept speaking. And they kept listening. Even though he was not trained in public speaking, he kept speaking. Why? He was called to speak. Regardless, his weaknesses. He says in 2 Corinthians 11.30, If boasting is necessary, I will boast about my weaknesses. Look at a humble man. I will boast about my weaknesses. Uh, boasting about your weaknesses is not a self-pity attitude. It's not like, oh, guys, look at me. I can't do anything. It's not about self-pity. It is the confidence that regardless of your weaknesses, God can still use you. You boast about your weaknesses because you know you've given them to God. Despite your weaknesses, God can still use them to do something. If you've been doubting about serving God, know that God does not use you because you have a doctorate, because you have a degree or you have a master's degree or because you have this in theology. That's not why. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying God does not look at those things before he starts using you. What, what, what school did he go to? A public or private? Where God doesn't look at those things. God looks at your heart. Are you available or not? If you are available, he uses you. Paul acknowledges he was not good in public speaking. Why? Because God still used him in public speaking and people were saved and people were transformed and healing was taking place and revelations were coming. If he was not good at public speaking, he could just stay one place and write books and send letters away. He was going there to speak even though he was not trained in public speaking. Moses was a very humble man, more so than any man on the face of the earth. Look at what King James says. Now Moses was very meek or gentle above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. The Bible calls Moses humble because he was the greatest of all the prophets. You know why? No one was there when God created the earth. No one was there when, when God created human beings. How do we know God created the earth? How do we know at the beginning it was the light, at the beginning it was... How do we know that? Moses is the only person who has seen that. And he wrote it down. Is the only prophet who went back in time and saw how God created and everything and he put it down. At the beginning, at the beginning, at the beginning. Moses. That's powerful. I wish I can see that. I wish God can just reveal to me how the beginning was. No, I don't need even to go that far. I just need to grow my, to see my grandpa and my you know, just to see a few things. Just to see a few things and see my wife, how she was born. I want to see that. God, please show me. How was it? Moses went thousands of years before him. And still he walked with people. Speaks with people. Humbly. That's gentleness. That is gen That's why the Bible calls him the humblest, if that word exists, Man on earth. Imagine God tells you what you have in your hand, a microphone, or put it down, put it up, put it up, and, and, and then do this, and then there is the water divide. No, I, I wouldn't say hello to anybody. I'll leave that place. Me. Did you see that? Did you see that? I can do it again. Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> Moses did not do that. Turn the water, divide the water, and then, oh, let's pass. 
and he remained the same. And God tells him, I will destroy everybody and start a new nation through you. Oh, you know what I would say? God, what were you waiting for? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I will become the father of Abraham. I will become like Abraham. Everybody will know, will come from me. My name will be there. It was, at the beginning, it was Mike. <laughs> then everybody will come from me. Moses turned down the opportunity. He said, no, 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 God. If you want to kill them, kill me too. No, so who am I going to start the new generation with? Uh, no, no, if you kill them, kill me too. That's how humble the man was. Strength under control. <laughs> Let's turn to the New Testament quickly. <laughs> Jesus Christ himself. Philippians Chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a man in his eternal form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Gentleness is a product of our submission to God. It is the mindset of a person who acknowledges the power of God in their achievement. It is the mindset of a person who does not see limitations regardless of their weaknesses. If you acknowledge that God can still use your weaknesses to fulfill his plans, you are gentle. And if you can see that your strength don't give you success, but God uses your strength to succeed, you are a gentle person. It's both. You acknowledge your weaknesses. You acknowledge your strength. You bring both to God. You are a gentle person. Recognize your strength. Get out of your bubble. Self-pity. Thinking you can't do anything. Or you are not good enough. Get out of that box. Don't give the enemy the opportunity to disqualify you from the game. God needs you to fight on his side. God needs you to play on his team. He created you for a reason with a reason. God gave you a purpose. Whatever skill you have, whatever knowledge you have, whatever ability you have is what God wants to use on his team. Don't give the enemy an opportunity of disqualifying a player on God team by staying back because you think you can't be used by God. You are too much of a sinner. You are too weak. You will have no skills. You are not good enough to serve God or to do anything. Forget about that. That is the enemy's strategy to keep you in a box. Bring your weaknesses to God. Bring your strength to God. The second point is restrain your strength. Remember this, an unchecked strength is a weakness. And a checked weakness can be a strength. Restrain your strength. And finally, rely on God. Remember that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ.